um, Zoom and or um, various platforms. I encourage you to go to the City of Ames website and you are able to access the hot link for the Zoom meeting and or find out how you can call in toll free and, um, and listen. Uh, the next three nights on uh, tonight, tomorrow night and Thursday night, presentations from staff to council on proposed budgets will be provided. And uh, just by way of information, there will be no public input received uh, the next three evenings, you have the opportunity to give input on any item on the budget at our February 9th meeting. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, Steve, do you have anything introductory? You're going to go ahead and just let Sheila start. Let's go ahead and have Sheila start. All right, Sheila, go ahead. Welcome. Hello, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and pull up my screen. And if you want to go ahead and... Uh, share what pages you're going to be uh, going through too also Sheila. So the library services are page 160 start on page 166. And we'll be highlighting you know we were asked to kind of focus a little bit on you know our response um, during this pandemic um, to stay connected and offer library services so I need to start from the beginning. And I think this this slide, we connect you to the world of ideas. That's the library's mission. And I think we very much so, you know, continue to take that heart to heart. And we're just doing um, connecting people to the world of ideas in new and different ways. Um, I want to take a moment to say thank you um, for the decisive city leadership that's happened during this pandemic. Things were happening quickly last March and the city leadership made responsive decisions, very much set the path and empowered city departments, charging them to find new and creative ways to continue to respond to our community needs. Um, and I feel like we were reassured and with a shared purpose, staff could shift gears and quickly adapt our services to a virtual environment, which is what we did. So at the library, um, one of the first things we did was to shift um, to make it easy to get your library card online and to start being able to use it right away to access our over 1 million online resources. New account, hold, new account holders received a welcome email with information about resources they could access and an invitation you know, if they were having any difficulties to reach out to us. Um, we increased our online collections, so our things like um, online audio, ebook, streaming, video, and music, we amped those up. We also, knowing that critical, you know, how critical it's going to be for the community to have trusted news sources, um, especially when the um, information was changing daily, we added the New York Times and then a little bit later, the Wall Street Journal. We are also mindful that um, there was some anxiety around unemployment and maybe um, that we might need to support our community in building their skills or possibly looking for new work. So we added uh, Mometrics, which has um, a lot of test prep, not only for the usual SAT, GRE, things like that, but also for the trades. Um, so you could get plumbing, firefighter, um, so test prep materials there, and also Cypress resume for a resume skill builder. Um, we knew that there was some uh, anxiety in the um, education realm with parents and educators having to shift quickly to that hybrid model. Um, or an online model, we quickly um, tar said targeted emails, promoted on our social media, all the great resources that we already had, a combination of what we paid for, but also we, we went through and helped curate. There were so many things coming out. We did a curated list of just web resources for parents. Uh, we also shifted like programming online, so our story times, you know, something that um, could support, continue that educational support, but also be those, support that routine and that normalness. So when people are used to coming in every every week with their kids, they could still come in at a set time and see those familiar faces, have that early literacy um, 
space. And also these, if it didn't work for you at the moment, these are all archived online. So people have gone back to them and used them at their convenience. So that's been an ongoing um, success. We, we did our learning at home. So we did some videos that were based on um, explaining basic science principles through a weekly video. We highlighted great books to tie in, kind of introduced a concept. Um, initially, there were some activities you could do at home on your own, but now we have these activity kit bags that kids come in and get, and that's been a real um, excitement to see people, um, you know, the kids are excited for it, they make a beeline for it, um, there's fun things in there like magnets and, you know, cracking open a dinosaur egg, and so they learn a science concept, but also have fun doing it. We also knew early on that having a space for teens, you know, that social connection, maintaining that was really critical. Um, so we wanted to support that age group. So we identified a safe online platform for them to, you know, talk about books, movies, but also everyday life. And so they, they did that. And, um, our, our teen advisory group continued to meet and plan. So they've been active throughout. So we've maintained that, um, connection with our teenagers, which is, critical. Um, it's just a snapshot of some of the programs they've been doing throughout the year. Um, those are all team identified team led, but it wasn't just about youth. We did programs for adults and are still doing them. Um, many of our book clubs continued online um, and staff planned, filmed extensive genre highlight videos. And those serve a dual purpose. It wasn't just introducing um, new books and kind of like helping people know like what's new and exciting to read, but um, it also uh, offered that familiarity. If our patrons were used to coming in and talking to that familiar face, that regular librarian, they could see them and connect with them in a new and different way. The tech Tech help was a big thing. Um, as more people were entering that streaming and downloading environment, we wanted to make sure they felt comfortable accessing, it, accessing those. So we posted how-to videos and um, guides and helped people troubleshoot and then even offered these one-on-one -on -one tech tutor sessions to kind of troubleshoot your particular device. And people love that. They even know a few of the staff who are really savvy with it by name and ask for them. Another big thing was um, partnered with the uh, Ames Community School District and then also United Way um, to offer free books at summer meals or at the spring meals, usually initially in the spring when they were offering breakfast and lunch. Um, we gave out free books every Friday, and we continued that throughout the summer when the Ames Public Library um, continued its tradition. Normally, we would offer meals inside the building. Um, this year, we offered them in, in a drive through So they came through, um, picked up breakfast and lunch, and then they also got free books on Fridays. And that will be helpful for us um, as continuing as a summer meal site in the future. You know, and as the rest of the city was kind of like, we were all kind of planning for that, that July marker to uh, reopen. Um, we we uh, started a little early and offered holds pickup in um, mid-May and our public was thrilled and the demand for holds shot up exponentially. So just a shot of our early curbside, but then the holds process. You can see that, you know, earlier it was just that steady every year that dropped when we closed and then boom, shot up. And it has just continued to increase. We are at a 218% increase over this time last year. So those, there's really been a heavy demand on those holds. And also our downloadable circulation, um, downloading eBooks, um, audiobooks, that's gone up 50%. So people are learning how to use us, shifting the way they're using us, um, using our resources in new ways. Um, hot spots has been a, a hot theme this year. Um, we, it's, they've always been in demand, but we were able through the support of our Friends Foundation to get some additional hot spots. We also extended the checkout period because knowing one week doesn't usually cut your needs. So um, we checked those out for a month now, and those continue to be in high demand. We've had over 500 circulate since uh, March. Um, and that we found that was especially a lifeline during the jury show when people lost connection and new connection. So the ones we had available, we made sure we got out to people. Um, you know, when we did shift to um, in lobby services in July, as we opened, um, 
you know, we did it with the safety protocols in mind, but people were very much happy to see those familiar faces. We had the grab and go set up so you can get your grab and go bags. Those are especially popular with families because they can pick up those books for kids who kind of tear through those popular chapter books and things like that. We also offer the quick picks, bestsellers, popular movies. So those are the, those are the hot things that there would normally be a hold queue for. Um, but you can get those in the lobby for, um, their one week checkout. Uh, but if it's your lucky day, you can jump that hold queue and get access to that. And there's some limited browsing for both adults and children. And of course, those hot take home kits. And we also offer the computer lab. You know, we've been able to socially distance and spread out. Um, so it's a safe environment, but people um, rely on access to internet and computers. Um, they can also copy and print, um, you know, and we, we've accommodated, we, we've been flexible with people in the summer. We had a bunch of people who were taking um, the test, online test to be census workers. And so we, we made accommodations to make sure that they had the time they needed to take those tests. Um, and again, the derecho, you know, we were impacted by the derecho ourselves. Um, when it happened, we sheltered in place like 20 people in our interior hallway um, and had a little drama with a, with a battery that melted down. But um, once we were back online, we were there for, you know, helping the city with those info stations. And we also offered our cool, cooling, a space for cooling um, down and charging your devices. And also people took advantage of our free Wi-Fi and the mobile hotspots. And throughout this past fall, we've continued, you know, virtual programming. Uh, we, we took advantage building on relationships with our existing partners like Iowa State, um, Ames Pride, other community organizations to offer some of these that you see, um, you know, that were timely, you know, fake news, Black Lives, Black Stories, a racial justice film series, you know, and those were like interactive ones. So you, you engaged with um, a movie ahead of time and then um, came and had a facilitated conversation around it in breakout rooms. And so we've, we've really seen um, uh, people come to our virtual programs. We held something the other day that normally would, um, you know, get a good draw, but there was 160 people at, um, on Zoom for one of the um, genealogy programs or Ames History Museum programs that we partner with them on. And so that's probably more than we would have seen in person. So it's nice. We're planning that as we look forward, thinking that we will probably have some people who, who that fits their need. And so we have, uh, we're looking to um, incorporate a hybrid model in our programming moving forward. We added services. We have a new online readers advisory service. Um, so you go online, you put in the books that you like or don't like, and we will do a custom curated uh, book list for you. And people really like that in the world of like Amazon algorithms. They really like that personal touch and a little bit of that um, interaction from our librarians. Um, Things like outreach, our popular Project Smiles that services child care centers and daycare providers. You know, unfortunately, that had to be put on hold early on because uh, places where you couldn't go there, they didn't want your things. But slowly, we've been, we would, we've been adding, adding that back. And so we've been delivering books for a long time. And we do, we're doing the hybrid, um, the live Zoom. You can see our setup there um, where we Zoom live with the classrooms. Um, same is true with our home delivery. Um, you know, eventually the senior centers were able to accept uh, books back in. And we have, um, we rely on volunteers for a large part for that. So we just recruit, brought back a lot of our volunteers to help. And we have a setup for a contactless um, drop off at actual homes now. So that's exciting. And throughout this year, you know, that was a lot of a highlight of what we've been doing during the pandemic part of it. But previously, you know, we um, we worked on our strategic plan, which is a big undertaking. And that was an intentionally um, staff led. We wanted to make sure staff bought in to it. So staff led um, community informed strategic planning process. We surveyed thousands of community members, held six community engagement sessions with different stakeholder groups, had board and staff engagement opportunities, and worked with the City of Ames um, GIS team to do some gather some data and do some mapping. And we saw key themes emerge. So you'll see those in front of you 
equity, inclusion, civic engagement. I hope you're excited for that. Access, wellness, and staff development. Um, so works are already starting on that. We feel it very much aligns with a lot of the city's goals. Um, and it certainly continues some good foundational work that we've been doing over the years, but then prods us to do a little bit more. But, you know, all this wonderful, engaging, responsive service is designed, planned, executed by our talented and dedicated staff and our generous volunteers. You know, in a service industry, your staff are your product just as much as, you know, your physical space and collections. And so, um, We've been, I've been really proud of the work they've done, how they've really shifted gears and amped up their skills, especially with virtual programming and video and um, are doing a good job staying connected with the community. So those are some highlights of what we've been doing. I'm happy to answer questions or anything specific that stood out to you. Sheila, do you plan on going through any of the uh, pages 166 through 177 we saw or highlighting anything in particular? Pardon me? <clears throat> do you plan on going through any of the pages? In I, I think we touched on a lot of that stuff. Um, I think some things that maybe we didn't call out in particularly, you know, we did have the movement to go find free. That was part of our equity, um, a, a goal for that. Um, I think one exciting thing that was coming up was in, um, was working with the Eames Community School District. That's something that's in the works. Now we, we, we had a lot of contact with them last spring to do, um, uh, library card registrations, working with the high school, but this is an initiative that we're, um, been working with them. It's probably going to go before the school board to have their registration as part of the registration their ID automatically will be a library card. So I feel like that will really um, just remove a barrier and increase some access to students right away. So that's in the works, it hasn't, um, um, but it's gonna, should go before the school board soon. So that's exciting partnership, it just kind of takes it to a different level. Um, I think questions, questions for Sheila. Sheila, when we see commodities in our list of budgeted items, what does that include these days? So much online material and electronic access. You know, that's kind of our the, the city category for that. Um, I think that generally that can cover. I think that can cover those physical things, depends on what section you're looking at. But I think um, that can even be um, more everyday things, I think. I'm trying to look at my more detail. So I, th I think that covers I think we, get, we have our personal internal contractual and commodities is almost a big chunk of everything else. You know, contractual um, would be more of our service things like with our IT and things like that. But commodities, so much of our stuff falls under commodities, honestly. Was there a particular piece or area you were looking at? No, it just struck me that I wasn't sure whether that definition changed at all, because I know I typically think of library commodities as the book collection, the technology, um, things that, that are being used in the library every day, but you also now have added your electronic services, and I didn't know if those actually counted as commodities or if those are something else. Are they contractual? Where do those fit? I think there's probably two categories. Like if, it's, if it is a like a circulating item or part of our collection, it probably falls under commodities. If it's more like a software maintenance thing, then it would be contractual. Other questions for Sheila? 
Just out of curiosity, how many, uh, do you have any idea how many people access the uh, New York Times or Wall Street Journal online, or is there any way to measure that? We, we, ha we get those stats. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but the way it works is that they give you an allotment. You know, you have, you have X amount of um, access points, and then so um, when you go to log in, you'll need you get an access point, and then you each time you go back, you get one again. So it's not like um, it's a way to kind of um, have access to many users, but not all at the same time. So, um, but I could certainly look that up. I think it's been popular. The Wall Street Journal's a little newer. The New York Times, I think we did get in the spring, and the Wall Street Journal we probably got early early fall. Very good. Last call for questions for Sheila. I've got a quick one. Do you know what the wait time is for someone who would like to check out a hotspot? Mm -hmm. I have my colleague on. Uh, generally, we're seeing about a week wait time at this point. That's um, great. We Thank had you. a period of time where it was no wait at all. That's, that's awesome. Thanks. They did add some what they call like our quick picks too. So they hold a few back um, that are not reservable. So there's always one on hand and that kind of helps for that kind of emergency panicked. Um, someone comes in, oh my gosh, this happened and I have a dire immediate need and that's been working well. We thought we'd try that since it works with other formats. And uh, so they hold five back for that. Okay. They're all out now though. Very good, Sheila. Thank you all for all you've done and your staff, all you've done on behalf of uh, the Ames community under trying circumstances. So, uh, and can you just uh, give us a quick update? Uh, I understand you have some nice changes happened uh, yesterday. Yes, we went, we're back in lobby service. So uh, that feels great. That's, you know, everyone wants us to be, we all want to be back to full service and, um, um, so we did go back to lobby service and very, very happy customers there. A lot of a lot of interest in taxes. That's a big thing right now. Um, but people picking up their holds, getting those grab and go bags. I was down in the lobby yesterday and there was a flurry of, you know, kids coming in for those activity kits. So um, it, it does add that that personal interaction and just seeing people and connecting, even if they're not hanging out for a long time that, you know, keeping it safe, just that familiar face and being able to say hello and connect goes so far. Very good. Well, thank you so much for your time and uh, thank you for your report. All right, we're going to move on to uh, utilities program. John. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So this is, is always my favorite presentation of the year because most of the time when I come, I'm talking about equipment and projects and this is a chance to talk about people and programs. So that's where I'm gonna focus my, my presentation. And what better place to start than with the people who are responsible for assembling the budget. So I'd like to introduce to you again, uh, the members of our leadership team. Uh, Neil Weiss is our assistant director Lyle Hammes is our water plant superintendent, and Gary Eshelman is our water plant assistant superintendent. Um, Joe Krebs, you've been introduced to before, but I get to introduce him in a new capacity now. In December, Joe was promoted to become superintendent at the water pollution control facility. Mary Ann Ryan is our lab division supervisor, and Dave Bloomer is our water meter division supervisor. So these are the folks that not only prepared the budget, but they're the ones day in, day out that are administering the, the operating budget. So a huge shout out to them for the work that they do all year long. So I'm gonna start on pages 80 and 81, which is where the administrative division um, budget is shown. And there's really two sides to the things that happen in the administration division. One is the business side. So that's really the focus on the overall policy. The customer outreach is really um, housed here. Um, you know, the budgeting, rate setting, uh, regulatory affairs. Uh, you know, we're only a couple of weeks into this legislative session and it's already been busy. There's a lot of things that we're tracking. Um, and then the other side of the program is the technical support side. So um, 
the folks who administer all those projects we talked about a few weeks ago during CIP time, uh, this is where their salaries are, are housed. Um, the administration of the industrial pretreatment program, the fats, oils, and grease program. And those are also the folks who are up in the middle of the night after a rainstorm running the models as a part of that early flood warning system as well. And so in, in support of the activities that that group's been doing, I want to touch on a couple CIP projects that we didn't talk about two weeks ago. And that's because they're projects that are wrapping up in the current year and they didn't don't show up in the CIP book. But one of them is the conclusion of a multi-year, multi-million dollar rehabilitation of the digester complex at the water pollution control facility. Um, one is a major renovation of the um, cogeneration system at WPC with the replacement of one of the old engines with a new methane, uh, well, actually dual fuel fired boiler. And then a project that you just accepted is complete last week, which is the low head dam improvements in North River Valley Park. And here's a, a bird's eye view of what that improvement looks like. This was taken back in August and we were still under construction. But as you go downstream, you'll be able to very clearly see that the, the channel's been split in half. And on the left hand side of the channel, uh, that's the portion that's been designed for recreational purposes, specifically creating some um, small whitewater features for kayakers to be able to get in and, and play. And then on the right hand side, you can see there's, there's more weirs um, on that side. That's a f actually a fish passage. So the, the height bet drop between the weirs is much smaller. And so fish will actually be able to migrate upstream now past that dam, which they couldn't do uh, before. It was just too big of a, of a height elevation change. So we are planning a ribbon cutting ceremony for this facility on May 1st. So mark your calendars, 10 a.m. on Saturday, May 1st. And hopefully by the time we get to that day, we'll have some more exciting news about that project that we can share. So over the last year, because of COVID, um, a lot of our traditional customer outreach activities that we do just couldn't take place. So there was there was no eco fair, there was no pancake breakfast, you know, we couldn't do science fairs and all of those other activities that we normally do. So we made a big shift in our online presence and social media over the last year. And so I want to congratulate our social media gurus, Heidi Peterson, who's our department secretary, and Susan Cruz Rodriguez, they both managed all of those, those social media sites for us. And just a flavor of the types of things that we're sharing on that site over the course, course of the last year. Um, you know, started in the winter about how to avoid frozen pipes, um, discussions about the benefits, financial and otherwise, of tap water over bottled water. Um, a lot of focus on um, sharing our staff and the, the things that we do. Um, those always seem to be our most popular posts is when we're posting about people. Um, of course, as the summer wore on, talking about outdoor water conservation practices becomes important and all year long sharing information about COVID-19 and, and how that um, interacts with drinking water and wastewater services. So you can find us on multiple platforms. Uh, we're most active on Facebook and Instagram, but you can also find us on Twitter um, just by searching for Ames Water. So now if we turn the page to 82 and 83, this is the water treatment plant operations pages. And I can tell you that the, the last calendar year has been the most unusual year for water demands in my quarter century tenure with the, the city. And I'm gonna show you what that looked like to us. This is a chart that Lyle prepares for me regularly. And what you see here is over the course of a year, that blue ribbon shows you what the 20 year maximum demand has been per month and the 20 year minimum per month. So that, that lets us see where our current demands stack up in comparison to recent historical trends. So if we start at the beginning of the year, you can see February, we were kind of up near the top of those historical peaks, not quite there. Um, but in March, we fell down kind of in the middle of the trend. 
And what happened in March that would affect water demand? Well, most significantly, most Iowa State students left for spring break and didn't come back. Um, and so the resulting uh, impact on flows that we saw was that we fell down kind of into the, the middle of that last 20 year historical range. And then in April, we went a whole month with very few Iowa State students in town. And you can see that the demand for drinking water bottomed out. Um, actually, not only is that our lowest demand for the last 20 years, but Lyle went back at least to 1990. And that's our lowest demand for the month of April in at least the last 30 years. So certainly an unusual event that happened there. Then when we moved to May, flow started to come up a little bit. You know, we're starting to get into the growing season. Some outdoor water use is coming up. Typical May, we only have Iowa State students around for half of the month anyway. Um, so the impact of, of uh, the students being gone was, was mitigated a little bit. And then this happened uh, going into the summer. We moved into uh, a drought and we are, um, we spent most of last summer right on that line between a moderate and a severe drought. And what that did to drinking water demands was we saw them spike then over the course of the summer. Um, August was a new monthly record for August. And actually July of 2020 was our um, all time highest monthly demand for drinking water. And as we went through the rest of the fall, we stayed near those historical records. Um, and then in December, you know, we had students go home for Thanksgiving and, and not many of them around during the month of December. So we saw those flows um, drop back down again. So over the course of the year, a huge swing, uh, that makes it tough to try to predict revenues. Um, so we're, we're using three year monthly averages as we try to predict revenues moving forward. Uh, but through all of that, I've got to give credit to the, the staff of the facility who operated it and maintained it. Um, a lot of folks had to adjust their schedules as we've had folks out for different, um, different purposes. Uh, of course, the derecho had a, a huge impact on us when that occurred, uh, keeping the facility up and running. Um, so I got to give a shout out to all of the staff uh, at the water plant for keeping the utility running throughout the year. So we'll turn the page again now to pages 84 and 85, and this is the WPC facility operations. So captured here um, in a consolidated way is the administration of that facility, uh, the maintenance on the flood warning system, uh, the maintenance aspects of the facility itself, treatment of the plant, and then the farm operations and the, and the biosolids disposal on that farm ground around the facility. So one of the things that you might notice in the budget summary is that we went down by two FTEs in the WPC division this year. And that's um, from creating our new student operator program. So what we did was we took two vacant positions. We had a vacant operator position, a vacant maintenance position, and we've converted that into four part-time student operator positions. And so these four student operators um, are starting to, to close out some of their training. And once they're up to speed, they're gonna take over the weekend, evening and night shifts for us. And then as their class schedules allow, they will also be helping during the week with some maintenance activities. So Noel and Wesley are both Iowa State students. Uh, Tringa and Pranvir are both students in the Water Environment Technology Program with the Des Moines Area Community College. Um, and another um, little side note for both Pranvir and Tringa, they both call home Kosovo. So when they finish their education and their time with us, they're going to take what they've learned working with us back home with them. So that's, that's a pretty exciting aspect for us. But if we take those four and we um, pair them up with the, the four student operators at the water treatment plant that we've got, um, I can tell you that the future of the water industry is in really good hands. These are some really sharp folks that we've got working with us now. And of course, I can't leave the WPC discussion without 
showing you yet another press release announcing the receipt of a platinum award. This year, it was a milestone award year for us as we reached 30 consecutive years uh, without a violation of our discharge permit. Um, it is the second longest streak in the country. And while we'd always like to be first, can't help but root for that, that other utility that's one year ahead of us too, because we got a lot of appreciation for, for what it takes to get what they've accomplished. And the, the phrase I always use when I talk with anybody about this is that the distinction goes not just to the facility, but, but most more importantly to the past and present employees of that utility. And it really puts them among the very best of the best in the nation at what they do. So pages 86 and 87 is our laboratory services division. Um, these folks do the bulk of the regulatory compliance for us for both drinking water and wastewater. They do a lot of process control assistance for both of those facilities as well. Um, they do most of the sampling and the analysis in support of the industrial pretreatment program. And then as needs arise, um, they're doing things across the organization for other departments. And, and something that's really been ramping up over the last few years for them is support for activities for the Squaw Creek Watershed Management Authority and the uh, ambient water monitoring programs that Prairie Rivers of Iowa is undertaking. Um, and so I, I see that um, continuing and possibly even increasing as we start becoming more active in the watershed as a part of the nutrient reduction strategy for the water pollution control facility. Pages 88 and 89 are our water metering services. This is the water meter division. And these folks, even though they've got uh, technical job descriptions, they're really our front line for customer service. Um, Jake, John, and Josh are out in customers' homes every single day, um, replacing meters um, and helping with troubleshooting. And um, I, I really need to sometime forward to all of you one of the monthly summaries from the feedback surveys they leave. Every time they go into a customer's home, they leave a survey asking about the experience those customers had. And um, the feedback we get shows that they this is a group that's a tremendous ambassador for you and the rest of the organization with the customers whose homes that we're in. I do wanna highlight for you that if you um, look on the summary budget for meter, you'll see that there is a, a substantial jump in the commodities shown for water meter. That is that issue that I highlighted back when we talked at CIP time about moving a portion of the meters out of the CIP and into the operating budget. So even though there's an increase that shows up here in the operating budget, um, we are budgeting flat for the number of meters being replaced. We've just moved them from one program to the other. So that's the reason for that, that big increase that you see. And so the last thing as I wrap up, uh, just a, an early highlight that we are proposing a 6% water rate increase that would be effective with bills that are mailed on and after July 1st. Um, we will um, later in the spring when you adopt that ordinance that adjusts fees citywide, we will include in there um, other fees that are closely tied to that water rate, for example, uh, we have a price for purchasing bulk water at a bulk water sale station. Um, at that time, we'll adjust that fee upwards by 6%. And then we will also do our annual update to our meter setting fees. So once we get new bid prices for meters and brass products, and we know what our labor rates are going to be, we'll roll all of those up and update those fees as well. And so with that, I'll leave you with the hope that uh, 2020 is in the rearview mirror and there's something a, a little better ahead of us. And I'd be glad to answer any questions that you might have about our budget proposal. Thank you, John. Questions for John or comments? John, congratulations on 30 years. That's uh, an outstanding uh, recognition, great achievement. I had um, one question, page 84. Um, when I go through the budget, I'm trying to capture major changes, fluctuations in the budget. And one that I didn't see a description of um, 
on the WPC farm operations, the percentage is 24% down. Could you walk us through? Um, I'm always happy to see numbers going down, but but why, why so much on that one? Yeah, it's a it's a big percentage number. If you look at it, it's um, what it's about sixteen thousand dollars. So in terms of the overall budget, um, it's not a huge significant number. Um, I don't recall the exact breakout of what that reduction is, but I know that there are some expenses there um, that are tied to like soil sampling that we don't do every year. So that I'm sure that's a portion of it. Um, and um, we're also um, trying to coordinate with our tenant farmer because we it's we have a crop share arrangement there. And so it's just depending on what he's planning on doing for crops, what we're expecting the inputs um, in terms of, you know, fertilizer or those types of things going on there. Yeah, and you're right. It's a, it's a small amount um, proportionally. And then, so the 10% decrease, that's because of the shift to some student workers? Yeah, that's going to be a, a big portion of that. And it's also just taking um, a closer look at some of the line items and um, looking at what our historical trends have been and some places maybe where we haven't spent as much as what we've budgeted the last couple of years. We're just trying to back that down to match actual expenses. Okay, great, thank you. Welcome. Other questions or comments? <clears throat> Question while we're on that same page, it's page 85 though. I mm -hmm. saw somewhere that we might start seeing if compost can be put in the digester. Uh, and it might be premature to get our hopes up about that, but can you tell us a little bit more about that? And then I'm curious too on 85 there where the the numbers are listed about, you know, biosolids recycled. What do we expect we could do in terms of capacity? Yeah, so we, we have been in conversations with the staff at the resource recovery plant. Um, there's absolutely an option there to be able to take the food waste diversion that they collect and bring it to WPC and inject it directly into the digesters. Um, that's, that's a waste that's perfectly compatible with that operation at our facility. Uh, we are going to have to make some, some changes to the grease receiving station to be able to get that material in and be able to, to pump it into the digesters. And we think that we're going to be able to accomplish some quick fixes relatively easily. Um, and then a few years down the road, we have a bigger CIP project to renovate that grease receiving facility. And so we'll probably take a look at some, some further opportunities there. Uh, as far as the capacity and the digesters, um, we are not close really at all to what the design capacity is there. We've, we've got a lot of additional capacity. Um, and that's why we have been looking and exploring um, some options to um, try to uh, market ourselves to folks who have some high strength waste that we can bring in that um, could A, generate some revenue for us and B, increase our gas production, which in turn um, would increase the amount of energy that we're able to develop on site for use at the facility. So that's a pretty cool thing. So just to dovetail now, what is the end product then? We take the comp, the um, food waste from the resource recovery and bring it out to you. What is the end product? Methane? Yeah, we, so we get two end products. We get the gas that's produced, the methane, and the other is the biosolids, um, just like what's produced from the, the treatment of the wastewater. And that biosolids then is land applied on our farm field in lieu of purchasing commercial fertilizers for the crops. Um, so we're applying that at agronomic loading rates on our own farm fields. Great, thank you very much. Are we able to store all the methane we generate? We are right now. Um, we've um, Typically we will run our engines just in the afternoon um, so that the electricity that we're generating occurs at the same time that the utility is peaking. So we get some peak shaving credits on our bill as well as helping the utility. Um, but we're not running those engines all day long. So we do have the potential to run more hours in a day. And then as a part of that project that's happening right now on those engines, it should generate the ability for us to run multiple engines simultaneously. 
So we've, we've got the ability to generate more electricity if we can generate more gas. Good, thank you. Other questions or comments? John, could you just comment? I know you had uh, been working with trying to get your permit um, for the uh, water treatment plant facility. Is there any movement on that or was that been accomplished or? Um, so you're asking about the discharge permit at the water pollution control plant? Correct. Yeah, the right, water, water, I'm sorry, water pollution, not for water treatment. Yeah, the, the permit that we have actually expired in 2016 and we submitted a renewal application, but one of the issues there has to do with um, managing peak wet weather flows. And the DNR has told us that they would rather wait and get a statewide strategy crafted for that as opposed to trying to negotiate a whole bunch of permits one on one. Um, so no, there's been, been no action on that. But we do continue to take the steps that like with the nutrient reduction that we know would have been inserted into that permit had it been renewed. Um, and that by itself has helped the DNR feel comfortable that we're continuing to do the things that we need to do even in the absence of a renewed permit. Also just curious, has Burke shipped any um, uh, of their products, so to speak, uh, to our water pollution control plant yet? Or is, are, not, are they not up to capacity yet? Yeah, I know we've taken a, a few loads on a trial basis just to make sure there's no issues. Um, my last understanding was that they had not yet reached the maximum amount that the Nevada facility could accept. So we haven't seen that come to us yet. You mentioned that uh, legislature is already um, revving up and uh, just curious if you could just share what or tell me what, if you could just email me what issues there are so I can help, you know, as I represent the city down there, you know, this through uh, Metro Coalition and Iowa League of Cities, just let me know what's going on so we can be sure we're uh, addressing those, you know, together as well. So absolutely, we'll do that. Last thing is, you mentioned the water meter department, and I just want to say, Council will get an email every once in a while from people just just raving about the service, the timeliness of uh, um, staff. And you're right, they're do, they do a great job as ambassadors. So uh, it's just uh, refreshing to get those kind of positive responses. I think we pass those on to you or to Mr. Shanker and I think he's passed them on to you, but uh, people really do appreciate, you know, the, the timeliness and getting stuff done and, and really being, uh, you know, efficient. Yeah, it just uh, reflects the, uh, the, uh, the attitude and the, uh, the, uh, the excellence and service that and excellence for people that uh, we stand for. So wonderful. Thank you so much. Very much. You're welcome. Any closing questions or comments for Mr. Dunn? Or we're going to go ahead and move on. I got one quick question, John. Yes. Um, <clears throat> the student operator program has been very successful and popular as far as I can tell. Do we have good competition for those positions every year? Oh yeah, we do. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a competitive thing, and and we've been in the classrooms enough now. Um, the professors are aware of it. Um, you know, Lyle's got connections every spring and every fall. He's in a lot of those freshman and sophomore environmental engineering classes, plugging the program. And, and you're right, it's it's an amazing program. Those students are leaving with a resume that looks nothing like what mine looked like when I left college. One of our recent graduates, um, when he applied for a job with another utility out of state, the, the hiring manager called Lyle just to make sure the resume was true because he says, this is like a needle in the haystack candidate for us. That's great. I, I have heard very positive things from students that I have had in my business communication classes who have either done tours or had somebody come in to talk to them. And now I know it's probably Lyle who's talked to them. Very well um, could be. And uh, so I just wanted to, to check to see whether everything they were saying is true, that it's, it is a fabulous program. 
really exciting. Thank you. Great partnership. Thank you, John. Appreciate your time. You're welcome. Good night. Right. Good night. Mr. Joyner. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, thank you again for um, allowing us to present our budget. And as with the CIP presentation, I'd like to start out by thanking the division heads for their hard work in putting the budget together, as well as their hard work throughout the year in leading uh, their work groups and, and being general leaders in our organization. Um, so we have Justin Clausen, operations, Tracy Peterson in engineering, Damian Pregenser with traffic, McKinley Ritter, admin, and Bill Schmidt, resource recovery. So thanks to all of them. Um, then just real quickly, here's the organizational structure within Public Works, and then you can see the five divisions that those leaders that I just introduced um, lead and manage. John, is there any chance that you could make that full screen, make it easier to read? Perfect. All right. Thank you. Um, so that's just the, the organizational structure uh, within Public Works, again, showing those five uh, divisions that those leaders lead and manage. Um, then, as with the CIP presentation, we have a quick video just recapping um, the, the year past. Thank you, and um, I'd like to thank McKinley Ritter um, in admin, along with all the folks at uh, Media Productions on the hard work and putting that video together. It's uh, always fun to see that. So th thanks very much. Um, one thing you might have noticed at the end of the video was a little bit about Facebook. So uh, Public Works now has its own Facebook page, and that's been very important in, in reaching out and communicating with the public. Uh, during this uh, COVID pandemic. So as we go through the slides, some of the uh, pictures that you'll see on the, on the right-hand side of the slides will be screenshots from some of our Facebook posts. So we continue in the utilities program and under our operations uh, divisions, we have water distribution. So that's of course, maintaining the water mains and hydrants and valves. Um, 
it's a little hard to see, but that uh, very top graph is a graph of the water main breaks as we go th as having going through the fiscal year. So, um, and this data will be as of the end of last week. So you can see we're right about average, uh, just one under the average to date for water main breaks. And then uh, water distribution and sanitary sewer maintenance, uh, they basically share FTEs, it's the same work group. And one new uh, neat technology that we're getting, uh, we're proposing to get in sanitary sewer, uh, we refer to as the sewer rat. It's the rapid assessment tool. So what that graphic in the bottom shows, it's actually sending acoustics through the pipe and then it has sensors at both ends ends that can detect um, any blockages or narrowing or anything like breaks, anything like that that would interrupt that acoustic signal coming back. So it's a quick way to send an assessment of the pipes and see if there's some further investigation that we need to do. Uh, then also we have storm sewer maintenance. That's on page 96. Uh, so as that uh, name leads, that's uh, inspection and maintenance of all the aspects of our storm sewer system. Then continuing in utilities, we have our stormwater permit program on page 94. So that is managed by the engineering division and that's uh, carrying out the activities that are required in our stormwater permit. So heavy public education and outreach. We have many different cost share programs that the community can participate in. As John Dunn mentioned, um, as you know, there was no eco fair this year. So um, that's being replaced with virtual uh, eco chats as we go through this year. There'll be several different opportunities to engage in that. Then also different uh, partners that we collaborate with for watershed uh, monitoring and improvements such as Prairie Rivers. Then uh, finishing up the utilities, uh, public works portion of the utilities program, we have resource recovery and that's on page 98. Um, so again, uh, because of the COVID uh, pandemic, we were not able to have Rummage Rampage. That's been a very successful event, a growing event every year. We already have plans in the works for um, Rummage Rampage this year. So hopefully things improve with uh, vaccines and with the uh, virus and we're able to conduct that event. Then also, again, as, as uh, John Dunn had mentioned, we're working with WPC in a, a partnership and on how they can uh, help us manage the food waste diversion program. So we're very excited and appreciative to be, uh, have our partnership with them on that. Um, then also, uh, we have a partnership, as you know, with Electric Services to look at the op optimization of our, uh, of our program and what uh, technologies might be the most efficient and effective in moving forward. So we have a RFP out right now and those responses are due very shortly. We'll be uh, reviewing and rating those. Um, we'll be interviewing the top uh, probably three firms to hear their proposals and then be back to you uh, sometime in the spring with a recommendation for the consultant to help us through that study. Then one thing that we're uh, very proud of, we have a closed sanitary landfill, as you know, it's uh, been closed for uh, over 20 years, uh, around 25 years. Um, because of the good job, the excellent job that the resource recovery staff has done in, in managing that closed landfill, um, the DNR has, has told us that we can ask for a long-term environmental covenant rather than continuing, continuing with our closure permit operations. Uh, so that speaks to the uh, environmental quality and stewardship that our, our staff have been using out there at the landfill. So that'll enable us to greatly reduce the amount of inspections and reporting and, and uh, the, the interaction with the DNR and um, just assuring that we continue to be uh, good environmental stewards with that landfill. So that was rounding out the uh, utilities program. Um, any any questions on utilities before we head into transportation? Any questions for 
John on uh, utilities. Okay. There you can see the rundown of all the activities we have in the transportation program. So we begin with public works administration. That's on page 108. So other than uh, providing divisional and, and departmental support, uh, this is where the Ames on the Go app is managed and coordinated with the other departments and work groups that are utilizing that. So one kind of interesting thing, the bottom graphic, if you can see that, uh, the big spike is the derecho. So you can see the uh, very top one is the street light issues. And then we have uh, trees down and power outages, but uh, you can see that the, the impact that the derecho had and how this uh, Ames on the Go was able to be used as a tool uh, by our citizens and also by all of our employees. Uh, and as I mentioned, we rolled out our Ames Public Works Facebook. So if you haven't uh, started following us, uh, please go ahead and search that out and, and do so. One kind of fun thing you can see there on the right, um, we like to put up fun posts also. Well, I guess on the top is one I like to point out first. We were kind of poking fun at our uh, friends in police and fire trying to get us to like and follow us. Um, but on the, on the right hand side, um, a young lady, college student, left coffee for our street crew early one morning. So it was very nice and very appreciated. Uh, we also help uh, with the, with the uh, COVID. We've been doing a lot of things virtually that we had been doing in person. Uh, so we help coordinate those uh, virtual events, if you will. Then we move into engineering on page 110 and that's really the uh, conception uh, design construction of, of the CIP projects that they manage um, including survey and we'll be looking this coming year at enhanced uh, survey capabilities we're going to explore with other departments the possibility of um, sharing a drone so that could really help our efficiency on survey and inspections and, and uh, things like that um, engineering also houses our pavement management data. Uh, as I mentioned, manages the stormwater permit that we have. And um, as with uh, WPC, we've been heavily involved through the years with Iowa State students that work with us through a co-op program and also as interns. So that's been a great benefit to them and us. Next, we have traffic engineering. That's on page 112. Uh, one of the highlights uh, that this activity will be managing was pointed out in the CIP, and that's the traffic network master plan. Uh, we've heard now that we've received our grant for phase two, as well as phase one from the DOT. So uh, as I had mentioned during the CIP, the DOT continues to be big supporters of us moving forward with this master plan. Uh, another big milestone that we accomplished um, in October was completion of the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, the Forward 45. Um, that's a, always a big, big effort. It takes about a year and a half to two years to go through those updates every five years. And this activity also receives um, heavy council referrals and citizen requests for various traffic studies throughout the year. Then we have traffic operations. That's on page 114. So that's the signs, signals, pavement markings, um, making improvements in, in neighborhoods and in uh, neighbors' lives, uh, making ADA improvements at crosswalks, uh, signal enhancements, uh, things like that. And this is our first full year that we're moving into the skill-based pay program for our uh, traffic maintenance workers. So that's uh, providing them the opportunities and the incentive to continue their education, to expand their um, on-job capabilities, uh, help us react more quickly, uh, help us address any issues that might come up without having to delay to go find um, contractor help. Um, we also have had that in resource recovery for a number of years, 
and they have it in WPC as well and has paid great dividends in, in those divisions also. Now we have uh, snow and ice. So it's been on everyone's mind, I'm sure. Um, the typically way, typical uh, kind of broad approach is that uh, in, in general, our crews will um, manage the snow and ice removal activities across the community, unless it's a large or a drawn out event, and then we engage our contract partners. Those could be landscaping firms, um, construction firms, uh, local farmers, um, we also uh, have been working with fleet to make sure that our equipment has the most current updates. Um, and that, in that includes outfitting our units with automatic vehicle location services. So that enables us to uh, just do dr data track tracking, make data driven decisions on our uh, snow events. And it just number wise, again, there's no typical years, you all know, but budget wise, we we plan for 19 events every year. We've had uh, 12 to date, and I'm not sure that that counts Saturdays kind of ice and dusting. And we've received um, almost three feet of snow. So it's been an active winter this far, uh, so far. And uh, unfortunately, there's really no way to predict how that's gonna uh, continue forward through the rest of the winter and into the spring. I remember, I think it was two years ago, we were sitting very low in snowfall and then we just got dumped on through um, February and ended up with over 50 inches of snow. And I believe it was last year after this presentation, we only received maybe another inch or two of snow for the rest of the spring. So you, you just never know. Um, but one thing I wanted to point out, and uh, Justin uh, Clausen does a good job with uh, data management. Um, but the graph here on the bottom right, uh, that's our response time and you can see how it goes up and down every year and that's in response of course to the types of events number of events that we're getting but the thing to look at is that dotted line if you can see that uh, so that shows that the average response time per season has been continuing to trend trend down over the last seven years so uh, shows they're they're uh, continuing to uh, put efficiency as a focus the next slide shows a couple other uh, graphs I wanted to point out. Uh, the first one is salt usage. And again, this will be up through the end of the month, end of January. Uh, so I'm not sure that this counts Saturday's event, but you can see we're, we're just under our typical line with salt usage. And if you count Saturday, if that doesn't include that, then we're probably right up about to the red line, the average line. And then our snow accumulation to date, you can see we're um, to date typically would be 21 inches and now we're about 34 to 35 inches. So trending higher than our average. So just kind of some interesting data. Then continuing, we have parking operations that's on page 134. And again, that's the uh, meter maintenance, sign maintenance that's in the parking lots and the parking lot maintenance. Then rounding out our transportation program and rounding out the public works activities actually um, for this presentation is the airport. That's on page 138. Again, another big accomplish accomplishment we had in the fall of 2020 was completion of the airport master plan. Uh, we continue to receive excellent fixed based operator service from Central Iowa Air Service. Uh, they've been great partners, great at running the uh, FBO and the day-to-day -day operations of the airport. And uh, we did receive some derecho damage at the airport. We uh, received some uh, significant damage to the doors at the T hangar. So we've been working through that through both uh, insurance and FEMA as well. And then uh, you'll recall that uh, council approved the sale of a, of a parcel to Sigler. We continue to move forward with that. We're working with planning on the platting of that and also working with legal on the details of moving forward on that sale. So that uh, concludes the transportation portion. And that was also our, again, last activity in the uh, public works. So I'd be happy to entertain any questions you might have on any of that.
questions for John. John, this isn't a question, but I just want to thank you and your staff for dealing so effectively with the questions and complaints that we get about snow removal. I think the, the emails that I have seen are really well done. They explain situations well. They appreciate the concerns of the citizens. And I have nothing but good things to say about the way those issues are handled. Thank you. And Justin, I think, has written a lot of those as well. And I, just great responses. Yes, yes, he, he has. And thank you very much. That's greatly appreciated. They, uh, they really work hard. And I had mentioned they, they, they do a good job of really being data focused, but also they do a good job of being customer focused. So uh, thank you for your comments. Other questions or comments for John? So good, good story to pass out in a um, public forum like this. I was out for a run uh, a couple of months ago and it was pretty icy. And I came up, I was, in, I was in campus town and there was a individual who was sight impaired walking with a cane. And it was pretty treacherous uh, conditions really for running in that area. And I asked him if I, if it'd be okay if I walk with him because it wouldn't look very safe. And we talked, we went several blocks along through campus town and he shared with me um, just how valuable the at the intersections where there was more sophisticated signaling for the sight impaired what a game changer that is and it really allows him to navigate and be safe in the community and i knew that but just hearing that from him was a data point that i think was very valuable i wanted to share that with you uh, i know these are more expensive ways of handling these intersections but um, what a difference in the quality of life if our residents can feel safer navigating the community. But I want to just pass it on. I know these look like numbers on uh, pieces of paper, but they really represent quality of life issues. Thanks. Yeah, it's a great story and great to hear. Thanks for sharing that. Other questions or comments? I just realized I should also be saying thank you very much for the way you've handled our engineering concerns. I know I've had a lot of a lot of my constituents who've had concerns, especially down in Southdale and in some of the areas up around Old Town and uh, Tracy and Dean and uh, all of those folks who have been working with those projects have been very responsive. And I've, I've gotten excellent feedback from constituents about them. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. And they also do a good, good job of finding out what the the citizens' needs are and trying to incorporate those in the project. So, thank you. John, these are more CIP topics, but quick update on uh, South Grand Extension, if you could, how, that, how that's going and uh, completion date still uh, fall of this year. Yeah, just in general, uh, they look like they're setting the beams. Uh, I was down there a day or two, and I believe that we're still saying the completion date in. Uh, August, but uh, Tracy, do you have anything more specific or anything else you want to throw out? If you're still on. Looks like I am still on. Oh, yes, great. We, we are still on track, and uh, you're right. They are setting beams, which means that we're up and out of the ground. So uh, once we'll uh, start paving here, you know, this summer, and we we are planning a big rope road opening celebration once that one's uh, ready to open up this fall. I would just echo what uh, Gloria shared. I think that uh, even though there's some question on uh, our Squaw Creek, you know, project and uh, property procurement and easements, uh, it was very evident that a lot of time is being spent for community engagement, which is really important to council and really important to the, the city. Um, so thank you for doing that. Last question on the uh, water and sewer for our uh, Prairie View. Uh, has that come back or is that coming back yet this, uh, this, this spring or the bidding? It is. The so we are continuing to work with um, the EDA federal grant and get them the last documents that they want uh, this week. We will be getting those submitted. And then uh, we should be hearing they will take about a month for uh, an announcement of an award on that grant. Um, so we're in the pre-award phase. And so we're also getting the, through the um, 
SHPO review as well during that time period. So we will be looking at a spring bid letting. Good. Okay. Back. Any last questions for John or Tracy? Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good evening. Have a good evening to you. Corey, Fleet Services. Good evening, Council. Um, I'm going to go through the fleet and facilities budget. I'm going to start off with the fleet side of things. You can find this on page 248. Um, so as you can see, um, our maintenance, we had an increase, um, kind of the hourly rate since we're internal services. Um, we charged that back to departments. Um, that's basically all personnel costs. We were able to keep costs pretty low. Um, next year, we're estimating fuel at 245. Um, Dwayne usually helps me uh, estimate those, and he does a good job. But um, kind of a lot of it was pretty volatile when we were looking at budget uh, with COVID and oil prices. Um, but we think that would be pretty good. We did readjust this year down to two dollars a gallon, and you'll see that in one of the slides coming up that our fuel cost has stayed pretty low. Um, this year, we were able to get two new mobile lifts, so, so that's how we had four. Um, these lifts can move anywhere in our shop and lift equipment. Um, now that we have six, um, we're actually able to lift the ladder truck for the first time in our shop. That was the only piece we couldn't lift before. Um, we also have an attachment that will help out during snow. Um, we can pick up snow plow trucks with the wing on. Usually, you'd have to take the wing off to pick those trucks up. We can leave the wing on. Hopefully get them back out on the road moving snow faster. Um, last fiscal year, we purchased 52 vehicles and pieces of equipment for departments throughout the city. Um, fuel trends, you can see we're uh, staying pretty low um, on fuel. You'll see up in kind of the upper right that B100 is, uh, is currently cheaper than our diesel. We have a contract with REG for that to make sure the prices stay lower than regular diesel. Um, but you can see prices have kind of even went lower than they have. I mean, if you look back to 12, 13, um, we're about one third of what we were paying back then for fuel. So that is good for a lot of the departments that use fuel like police and streets. Um, green fleet, we're uh, at 25% of our fleet is now green. Um, we had the B100 conversions that went into effect. You can see those kind of on the bottom. Um, if you see them out moving snow, they've got the green stripe on them maybe some green plows. Uh, we have the hybrid police cars. Um, police is gonna talk about the benefits of those um, in their presentation, but you'll see these. I think we have two on the road now. Um, they kind of have a subtle green on the stripe. You can kind of see it there in the picture. It says hybrid on it, but uh, pretty encouraging what we've seen out of those vehicles and uh, police will talk more about that. So the B100 pilot project last year, we had five trucks um, where we put the systems on um, we use 10,500 gallons approximately of the B100. So that equates to savings of 104 metric tons of greenhouse gas. Um, as you know, we ordered seven new uh, trucks that will be coming here shortly. Um, so with 12 trucks, we think we'd use you know a little over double uh, what we saw. And so that would equate to 248 metric tons. And we also have an agreement that uh, we have with the Iowa DOT that we're working on. They have, uh, I believe, one truck right now, but we might have more that are in Ames. And so they're going to fill from our B100 tank. So it'll be kind of a unique situation. Usually we're used to going to the DOT for fuel. Now they're going to come to us for fuel. And uh, with the two tanks, we still use the DOT for the regular diesel. Um, but the B100 has worked. So you can see um, the picture here that, these are out in the cold weather working. Um, we've had little to no issues with the system, um, kind of regular truck issues, but not with the system. So it's worked well. Um, so that's why we're moving forward with the new trucks. Um, staff seems to be happy. There's no issues. There's no really change for the guys out operating the trucks. The only change is they have to fuel two tanks 
but having the tank close to uh, the maintenance facility is probably a plus for them. You can kind of see uh, this from last year. Um, the little graph shows the red is diesel. So these trucks can actually monitor the diesel versus B100. Because if you remember startup, we use regular diesel. And when we shut them down, we use regular diesel. So it kind of shows that almost all the time these are running, we are using the B100. How come that one truck used so much more regular diesel than all the others? 967 there. Yeah, it might have had more uh, kind of on off. You know, they shut it off and start it back up. Um, that could cause it to burn more. And the diesel trucks, sometimes if they go into, because of tier four emissions, there's like a regen where it has to kind of purge the system. Um, some that has to use regular diesel as well. But the other ones were pretty consistent, but it's probably mostly related to they're shutting it off and starting it up more often than the other trucks. Okay. Um, last year we did the, the greenhouse gas inventory. Um, you can, uh, if you remember that report, uh, fleet itself actually reduced greenhouse gas over the time period of that report um, by 4% and reduced our overall fuel consumption as well. And, uh, We'll also be participating as staff, uh, myself in the, in the new uh, RFP we're doing for the climate action plan. So we'll be involved in that as well and see what with fleet and facilities that'll be important as that goes forward. So what's the future? We Like we've talked about, we had um, seven more trucks coming. Um, we expect those in the next month or two. So maybe they might get some snow removal in. Let's hope not. Um, so our hybrid and electric vehicle choices seem to be expanding. Um, we have the hybrid police cars. Um, we have more hybrid SUV options out there. Um, as you know, Ford, Chevy, and Dodge, which tend to be the low bidders for us. They tend to be more government price focused. They have all phased out sedans. Um, but they do offer like smaller SUVs. We're starting to see some hybrids and those options, which is good because um, that pushes them up and over a small sedan um, for fuel mileage. Electric vehicles, um, we have the Chevy Bolts, but we're starting to see, you know, hear more news about, you know, um, there are some truck competitors to Tesla coming out um, that could be viable for us depending on price. And uh, hybrids, something we'll look at definitely in the future is uh, Ford's talking about their F-150 trucks, which we have quite a few in our fleet um, coming out as hybrids. And it could be a benefit because then you might not need a generator. Um, you can just plug into the truck to run tools and things like that. So it'll be interesting to see how that comes out. Um, the challenges we're facing in kind of procuring vehicles is there's less options for E85. Um, so even though we're doing the B100, um, we're seeing you know, those same three kind of um, GM, Ford, Dodge kind of move away from the E85. Um, and the cost of all electric vehicles is uh, still pretty high. Um, hybrids, we're seeing about three to 4,000 maybe upcharge to go to a hybrid. Um, going to all electric, um, right now it's just the sedans. You're looking, you know, eight to 10,000 more for all electric. And uh, so hopefully those costs continue to come down so we have more options for to so. Um, that does it for the fleet part. So are there any questions on the fleet? Corey, on that question, just given the number of miles that our vehicles drive, do you have a, a general sense of the break-even point that if we go with an electric vehicle because we don't have to, to put fuel in it throughout the day, do you have a sense of where that break-even is where we've just now paid for itself? Yeah, we'd have to calculate it. I would say right now, most city vehicles don't put a ton of miles on. Um, so like police vehicles, obviously, they would probably be our number one in the city. There's a few other departments that have large miles that we can maybe look at that and see the break-even point. But right now, it's kind of hard, to, like we showed on the fuel. Um, with fuel being so low, it makes that break-even point pretty hard to get. But uh, we definitely will start looking at that a little bit more if we get some more options. And then you can also look at maintenance. Um, police will talk about that, even the hybrids we see. You know, definitely savings on maintenance. Um, you're not doing oil changes, things like that. So it, I think we're, we're close. We're almost to that tipping point. We 
where it's going to make sense for more people. But then we're also going to have to have you know a discussion on infrastructure. Um, how do we make sure these are charged and available? Um, so it might depend on where they're located, things like that, on the cost of the infrastructure to charge. Um, kind of like you talked about with SciRide, you know, redoing that for their buses. We'd have to look at that, um, depending on how many, how long we need to charge, things like that. Great, thank you. Corey, there seems to be a, a significant decrease in the fleet acquisitions budget. Is that because we've recently made large purchases and we don't need any right now? Is that a concerted effort to cut back because we just don't know what the budget situation is going to be in these COVID times? What, what accounts for it? Oh, I think Corey locked up. Your question frozen, Gloria. I stunned him with that question. Yeah, we'll give him a second to try and get it back on. I thought he looked incredibly attentive. <laughs> I tapped on the screen. It, it didn't work. This is Dwayne. <laughs> um, but we, we have delayed some of those replacements. That was part of our, our COVID package. We did that you know, for the two areas that we collect. Um, fees to essentially replace products over or equipment over time. That was IT and fleet. So we've extended the life and then therefore reduced the, you know, the amount of money we have to put away for those. And, and you know, Corey did a lot of evaluation on that equipment and, you know, how we would do that and still keep good running equipment while reducing the expenses. So that, Thanks, that was the reason for that. I'm next, so I can get started if you don't have any questions for Corey. Let's go ahead and go, Dwayne, and then when Corey comes back on, he can circle around and he can talk about facilities after he gets back on. Okay. We'll ask like I, act like I didn't answer his question already. <laughs> I'm going to cover several different areas, and I'll, for the most part, you know, I, I think we kind of reflect the, the theme as Steve went over for the budget. And that, that was uh, basically holding expenses pretty even. So I will point out the areas where there's uh, significant differences in some of our expenses. Um, but for the most part, as, as we go across all the different areas under finance, uh, you're gonna see uh, pretty flat budgets. And the first area, I always point this out as an, an area that reflects our, our program best base budget and that's uh, economic development. We don't have a, an economic development department or division. Um, there are some personnel services uh, reflected here in this budget, but that's primarily Steve and I. Steve, for all intents and purposes, is our economic development director. He leads this uh, activity within the city and then it's supported by uh, others as we're called upon. So myself, the planning department, uh, anybody else that, that we would need to work on an economic development project. If you look at that activity on page 200, you'll see a, a pretty significant reduction in the budget. It's down about 13%, but essentially all of that is related to the reduction in the pass-through to Ames Convention and Visitors Bureau. And that is, is due to, of course, the, the reduction in the hotel motel tax. Uh, some of the bigger items that were we've either done or working on in this area. Um, we established a second TIF district out in the ISU Research Park. That was in the same urban renewal area that we had already set up a few years ago when uh, there was some additional development out there, but that's a second small, small TIF. Um, a big item that we're working on right now is the application for the Iowa Reinvestment District and that's for the development in the, along Lincoln Way and some other areas downtown, but it's for some improvements downtown. Uh, that's uh, several people working on that between park and rec, planning, manager's office, myself. And uh, Nancy pointed this out to going over the funds, but I think it's worth uh, pointing out again, um, our, our TIF funds, and, the, and that pays for debt service, and we also will have some rebates. We had seen the balance go down on that uh, every year as you know, we paid debt service, but we were not collecting enough 
TIF to, to cover that. But over time, that is now flipped the other way. So the balance is increasing and is, is in the positive territory. And when we collect enough to pay off that debt, we, we stop collecting the increments and that goes to, to general taxation. So uh, generally good news on the TIF funds. Uh, we'll have uh, a new urban renewal area coming up for uh, the extension of utilities along 13th Street. That'll be a, a big uh, activity. We have some bonds in place for that. And also assuming that uh, we have an approved application for the IR reinvestment district, there'll be an urban renewal area for that uh, district also. We'll, we'll move on and I've, I'm just kind of calling out the pages. I'll, I'll cover them as we go through it. These are the areas that are within the finance department. And I won't spend really much time on debt service. We covered that quite a bit last uh, Friday. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll hit that just briefly. I'll jump right into the, the other areas here real quick. Uh, financial services, and this area uh, covers both finance administration. And for this, we're on pages uh, 226 through uh, 228 for the other activity, that's uh, accounting services. Uh, very flat, the finance administration is up about 2.9%. Essentially, all of that was related to personnel costs. And with some new employees, we have some additional uh, education expenses as some of those uh, uh, newer employees are expanding on their education. So they'll be ready to be our, our, our possibly our leaders in the future. Uh, the accounting uh, activity is actually down uh, one tenth of a percent. So essentially flat. And, and that was all due to uh, turnover and personnel costs. You, you might notice on that one, we have commodities are up 22%, but it's it's like $1,000. Uh, there was a question on commodities for the library a little bit earlier. Uh, for that activity, it's primarily just office supplies. So a fairly small number, but up a little bit. So it, it makes a bump. Uh, some uh, Items going on in, in this area, we've continued to maintain our AA1 GO bond rating. And as you've seen over the years, our, our bonds, though rated one notch lower than the highest possible rating at AAA, we've been trading at very close to that AAA uh, level. So the, the credit markets uh, view us as, as a very good uh, AA1, and that's, that's good news for the city going forward. We've continued to maintain our GFOA certificates of excellence, both for our, our budget document and our comprehensive annual financial report. Uh, we've implemented an electronic document system, and, and that's an imaging system where we can drill down our finance system. Uh, we continue to expand electronic payments. Uh, some other areas we've spent a fair amount of time on is the CARES Act funding. Uh, Steve had brought that one up as part of the overview of the budget. Uh, that funding is received and in hand that that was done um, and then we've got a couple uh, new pages in the budget and I think Nancy had pointed those out on 202 and 203 and those are our FEMA activities so uh, we don't often have a, a FEMA grant program in the budget uh, right now we have two uh, there's there's one for COVID which is still open but we've mostly uh, incurred the expenses that we think we're going to incur, that's around $100,000. The one we're spending a significant amount of time working on as our several departments is the Duratio grant uh, to recover what we're estimating at around $1.4 million for expenses occurred due to that storm. We'll move on to purchasing system. We've just recently rolled out our electronic bidding system called Ames Bids. And I've, I've got a picture of our webpage up here. Uh, you know, if you're interested in looking at that, that's out, out there. And that, that's just another way that we hope that we can expand our reach for uh, potential bidders on city services to, you know, do two things, open that up to as, as many uh, potential bidders as possible and, and help us uh, achieve our goal of having the, the best service at, at the best price. Um, this division supports a lot of large city initiatives and a couple of big things this year. We got a, a picture over there. It was the COVID communications. So you think about all the 
the markings we have around City Hall, the, the things we worked with Susan on to have uh, some good communications out to the public, uh, the purchasing areas worked on that, and also the supplies. There was a lot of consumables that came along with uh, our, our push to make sure that we can open safely and, and have both a safe environment for the, for the public that comes in to do business with us and also our employees that are here. Uh, we uh, also implemented electronic document management system, same, same system, but it, it also serves uh, purchasing. Uh, this group was up about 1.9%, so uh, fairly flat. As we go through, you'll see that kind of as a recurring theme. Uh, next area is information technology on page 250. Uh, they're up uh, less than 1%, 9 tenths of 1%. Uh, council members uh, were certainly aware of this since you're on our email system, but uh, we made a big transition this year from IBM Notes to uh, Microsoft Outlook, Office 365, and the Teams uh, collaboration environment. And in some ways that couldn't have been more timely. Uh, that's been a, a really nice product for us to be able to hold meetings, collaborate, share information. At a, at a, sometimes we're, we're all in this building, but we'll just go ahead and use Teams because it's more people that we can uh, have in a room and, and maintain the social distancing. So it, it's been nice to have that. Uh, we continue updates on our network infrastructure. And you know we're seeing over time, just like other uh, places that there's more software systems are transitioning to cloud-based. So we want to make sure we have uh, both a robust and secure network in place to support that. Uh, we've installed uh, core network switches. So that's the main switch for all the traffic that comes through. And we actually have two now with uh, redundant connections out to, out to the internet uh, in separate locations. So the, the theory being, uh, we have a failover, uh, you know, possibly both could go down, but it, it does add a lot more um, reliability. Um, MFA, which is multi-factor authentication. I think people see that on a lot of their different accounts now. So in addition, just to logging in, you'll will need to get a phone call or some other second way to uh, authenticate as you sign into our systems. Uh, we've completed uh, workstation imaging for the for the city uh, computers, and we're, we've encrypted all of our mobile devices, and we'll, we'll begin to work on uh, desktop devices in the near future. Uh, this area has responded to a lot of the COVID uh, challenges to maintain services, uh, working on remote access for the employees when they need it, and also to support things such as uh, videos for not only the council meetings, but the can bid uh, sessions and, and several other things that have, have moved to that uh, format. The last area I will cover is utility customer service. Uh, this area is an area in City Hall that you know, probably gets the, the most kind of regular customer interaction. Uh, for the period that we were closed, we are set up to, to handle uh, everything either online or over the phone or, or uh, you know, not in person. But we do have a lot of customers that like to come in and, and you know, it, it's, it's our uh, intent and duty to, you know, provide the services the customers are looking for. And so we made some adjustments. You can see a picture there with a pass through of the, of the drawer so that we can provide service to those customers that need to or want to come in and can get the service in person safely here at City Hall. So they're comfortable and, and we're comfortable. Uh, we're, we've implemented and continue to implement uh, multiple COVID relief assistance programs. And I think Vanessa will probably talk about those a little bit more since most of them come through her. Uh, we're in the process of implementing the solar uh, credits. Uh, it was so important, I wrote the solar twice. Uh, community solar solar credits. Uh, that that is the, the the customers that have bought the shares. Is that uh, solar farm produces energy? They'll receive credit uh, based on our cost of service on their electric bills. Um, this area might get talked about a little bit more with uh, with parking, but we've implemented a new parking ticket collection system. Uh, it's a company called United, and that's. 
that's done web-based. It adds a lot of uh, additional payment options to our customers and it's uh, rolled out pretty well. There were some, you know, with additional convenience came some additional fees, but um, yeah, I think so far what we've seen, they've been uh, pretty well received by our customers. Uh, as far as expenses in this area, we did make a change as we had some turnover. We used to designate uh, some employees as utility cashier or um, parking ticket cashier. But as we had turnover, we combined some positions so that we would just have cashier with the intent of cross training and, and have a little bit more flexibility for employees. So we had one of those activities was actually down 8.4% and one was up 3.4%, but combined this area that provides those two services was up about 2.38%. So uh, again, uh, uh, fairly flat. And that was primarily due to personal services. And a fair amount of that was due to uh, turnover and an employee or a position that went from uh, single insurance to family insurance. So that uh, we see in areas with not a lot of employees and other expenses that can impact the budget. So unless there's any other questions, uh, that's all I have for the finance department. Again, uh, fairly flat budget across the board. Questions for Dwayne? Dwayne, I, I just had one question. A lot of, uh, let's see, on page 228, where it shows reimbursements under expenditures by activity? Is that just when you're uh, shifting money out to something? To, to, is that just internal transfer or how does that work? Yeah, I'm gonna maybe ask Nancy to jump in here, but if you look down at our funding sources, um, when we have funding from the utilities and, and other funds, that shows up down here as a fund. Uh, source, but I believe the ones up here are the internal service ones. Yeah, that's correct. Um, it's also, we have a couple of programs that need to show those uh, type of fees, like accounting services within their program. The internal services is one and transit is another. They need to show their fees directly. So uh, we shift them instead to their program so they show up on their own activity page. The rest of them where they're paid like possibly the water fund or the sewer fund continue to show here with a funding source at the bottom instead. And there's a couple of other areas where you'll see that same uh, situation of uh, purchasing, for example. And you know, I, I guess the SIRA is a, a good example and that's related to the grants. So they need to show that expense over there and we eliminators or reimbursement in the activities that are charging them. We made that change several years ago due to some reporting requirements. And then the, uh, the uh, CARES funding that came through to help offset you know, our budget, does that get spread throughout the budget or is that just um, a are you just handling it just as a, uh, an in, a new additional income stream and it just doesn't show up on the individual um, departments? So that, that was all recorded as a, a revenue in the general fund and it's in the current year. And so effectively, when you think about the general fund, um, you know, we had some reductions in revenue, primarily in, in parks and recre recreation. Those, those two are totally unrelated, I, that does help to offset that, that loss of revenue in, in that area. Great, thank you. Any other questions for Dwayne? Well, Dwayne and Nancy, as always, these are uh, just extremely well done and uh, um, a lot of information that seemed to be easy to follow and understand. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Corey's back. Corey's thought. Corey's thought out. So, all right, Corey, take us home, buddy. All right, we'll try this again. Once I get my screen share working.
I believe that um, Gloria had a question that she was posing, and then you end up fr freezing. Yeah, Gloria, was your and Dwayne uh, was helping answer that question, so I want to make sure. Gloria, was your question answered? Yeah, Dwayne answered it. Sorry, Corey, I I stunned you with my question, and uh, uh, I, I must I panicked, so I just jumped. <laughs> Uh, Dwayne, Dwayne handled it, so that's fine. Okay, if there's any other questions on the fleet, or I'll jump to facilities quick. I just have a comment, and that is, and it has nothing to do with the city of Ames, but I'm pretty disheartened to see there's less options for the E85, because that does not bode well for ethanol, nor does that bode well for our state in terms of corn production. Is, is that what you're seeing? Uh, Corey across the nation in terms of E88, E85 just falling out of favor. Yeah, it seems like uh, Dodge has kind of all the way removed themselves um, from the equation on their trucks, especially light trucks. That's where we see a lot of benefits out of the E85. Um, Chevy, very limited, it seems like. Um, Ford's uh, got quite a bit of E85. They haven't moved away from it. So I think that's why you've seen more Ford trucks in our fleet. Um, so it just seems for some reason that uh, in the truck market, they're kind of moving away from that. Um, if they move to hybrids, you can see more of that. Um, hybrids cannot use the E85 uh, right now. So that could be part of the reason too, is uh, these manufacturers look to electric and hybrid that they're moving away from the So that's, that's the future then for the fleet is that E85 is not really an option in terms of even purchasing vehicles. It's going to be either hybrids or electric. Is that accurate? Yes, I think that's where we would see the fleet moving um, as, you know, these light trucks to medium duty trucks move to hybrids. Um, I think the B100 for the larger trucks, that'll be around for quite a while. Um, I don't see hybrids or electric moving into that realm. Um, during the life of these trucks where it's, you know, available for a price point. So. Thank you. All right, I'll move to facilities. Um, some projects we did over the, the last year, um, Dwayne kind of touched on this, a lot of COVID-19 mitigation efforts with the plexiglass cleaning supplies. Um, we were pretty involved in that throughout. Um, still are involved, um, making sure there's extra cleaning and things like that done, um, responding to any COVID concerns with disinfectant. Um, the key card access control system, um, those bids are due next week. Um, the approved plans and specs, so those are out. Um, we've seen some interested parties, so uh, we'll be back at the end of February with a recommendation on award. Um, you awarded the fabric building, so at the maintenance facility, so that will go in this spring. Um, one good thing in facilities is uh, John Forth came back this year. Um, he's been assisting with the Homewood Clubhouse during construction. Um, I think that's been a good help. Um, we recently hired a consultant for what we're calling the City Hall Interior Refresh. Um, so we're looking at things like color palette, color palette flooring, um, shades, furniture. A lot of these are recommendations that we can do over time. Um, I know a lot of you haven't been to City Hall, but since John's been back, we've removed a lot of wallpaper. Um, we're experimenting with some colors on the walls, um, kind of to see what that will do. Um, the consultant will give us a color palette and we'll do that over time. On the flooring, um, Steve kind of recommended as part of his list of projects of maybe giving more money to City Hall improvements. Um, one thing he mentioned was flooring, um, where we could look at replacing all the carpet in City Hall. So that would be a very big project that will take quite a while to plan that out. Um, but we're going to work with the consultant to make sure we have the right type of carpet. Um, as you remember, we talked about replacing some carpet in police with some different alternatives, and we'll look at that as well. So as I talked about flooring, that'll be a big project. Um, we do that project. That means you have to move people out of their offices. Um, it could be for extended time period. Um, we'll have to do some research on asbestos removal. Um, if there's asbestos under the carpet, um, if we're going to do paint, because of the color palette changes and things like that. So we'll have to really coordinate with departments to make sure we can get them alternative space. 
Um, we'll be coordinating uh, as the plaza and the new parking lot on 6th Street move forward. Obviously, those both have a big impact at City Hall. We expect the auditorium HVAC um, to come back sometime this spring, um, looking at fall construction, trying to get through the summer. Um, we don't want to take the AC offline while we're using the auditorium. Um, right now, we're kind of looking at working with Alliant in the city, um, discussing rebates. We can bring that back, see if there's some rebate opportunities there. And we'll continue to work with other departments on their projects. Um, you know, uh, new building projects like the indoor aquatic center go forward. We'll probably assist with that um, design process. I think John's been a little bit involved in that already. So that's kind of facilities um, overall. Um, happy to answer any questions. Questions for Corey? Corey, is there any um, uh, plan for going to LED lighting in the uh, public areas, corridors, and looking at the ceilings, you know, at City Hall? Yes, yeah, so we have LED lighting everywhere in City Hall, except um, kind of the two by two um, fixtures. Um, we're experimenting with uh, LEDs that came out because those use a special bulb, a U-bend bulb. Um, John's been experimenting with some LEDs to replace those. So yeah, they'll be part of this kind of whole refresh that we'll look at. Um, so we'll kind of, once I think we have the color palette and some suggestions and maybe get an idea of cost, I think we're going to sit down and kind of look at, hey, okay, where do we start? Um, you know, how do we budget that or use John's time and effort uh, to get that done? So we'll probably be looking at vinyl based things like that. So hopefully they'll all be part of it. And then, but be able to do it over time and not have it be too jarring. You know, we'll be looking at things like furniture and replacing some of the benches in City Hall. So, so we've uh, talked to a consultant about making sure, you know, new colors would kind of match with the old colors. So we didn't have to make this kind of walk in one side and, you know, it's completely different. Um, so we'll work on that and uh, hopefully we'll see that kind of, you know, the spring or summer, have some ideas and move forward on that. If we just hang on long enough, the pink and the blue are going to come back. We're already yeah. in that that cycle, you know. So we probably don't want to make radical changes, Corey. <laughs> I know wallpaper is coming back a little bit. So maybe we jump the gun, but uh, you'll still have pink and blue in the restrooms. I don't, I don't see the pink going anywhere for a long time. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Corey. Appreciate your time. All right, thank you. Thanks for sticking with me. All right, that concludes this evening's budgets. We're going to move on to disposition of communications to council. Council, we have uh, uh, Deb Shildroth forwarded one email from. Uh, Mr. Long regarding rezoning the west side of Grove Avenue from high density residential to medium density residential. Is there any interest of in referring this to staff? If not, we'll notify them that there's no interest at this time. Council, I had a discussion with uh, Mr. Long. Um, he's one of my constituents, so he contacted me about the process. And as I understand it, um, this is a situation that while well, we discussed it when we were looking at Sherwin Williams possibly moving into that area. And I would be interested in getting a memo from um, staff on the situation there because I think when Kelly presented to us, um, there was some comment about um, whether high density was actually appropriate there or not. And so I would move that we get a memo from staff. Sir, second. A second. Okay, move that round. Uh, Gloria, say my round. I was able to go ahead. So, so, Steve, any feedback from Kelly on this? Nope. Well, let's refer to for a memo and we'll give you the information. Okay, great. Those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. 
All right, moving on to council comments. We'll start with you tonight, uh, Gloria, tonight. Well, um, it looks like the International Town and Gown Association has extended their early bird rate. So if any of you are interested in attending that conference with me, um, let me know because we can get a discount, I believe working with Iowa State on that. Um, I don't think I've got anything else at this point. Very good, thank you. Tim. Uh, we had an Iowa making history again today. Uh, uh, secretary Vilsack, I watched part of his um, uh, hearing uh, become Secretary of Agriculture again. So it's wonderful to have representative of Iowa in such an important role. That's all. Thank you. David. No comments tonight. Thanks. Thank you. Rachel. Nothing tonight. Thanks. Amber. Nothing for me. Nicole. Nothing tonight. Alan. No, nothing for me. All right. I have nothing either tonight. All right. Entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. All right, Amber. We are adjourned. We'll see you tomorrow night at 5.15. Night, everyone. Night. Bye.